Welcome friends to this episode of the Sync Your Life podcast. Today I'm joined by MJ Gordon. I had the great Hi. pleasure of being interviewed on MJ's podcast recently and could not wait to get her into the opposite seat so that I could interview her for the Sync Your Life podcast. So I'm so grateful that she's here. She's taken time out of her day to share her wisdom with us. I love following her on social media. I think she's got such great energy. I think we're going to connect on some topics today for my listeners. My listeners are mostly, if not all women who are living a busy lives in today's society. And so I know you speak directly to things like burnout and mindset, and these are things that women need to hear. So first and foremost, welcome to the show. I would love for you to sort of kick us off with a little bit of your story. So tell us who you are and how you got to doing what you're doing. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's always exciting to be able to share more about this topic and help women. Um, I am a mom, a health enthusiast and entrepreneur, and I spent, you know, most of my early adulthood life really pursuing and chasing dreams from career to business building and um, having been a former athlete myself. Uh, I, I actually reached that burnout pretty quick in life. So I was in my early mid twenties and um, was trying to keep up with the whole workout gym thing, but I had gained a ton of weight because I was no longer an athlete, but still on an athlete's diet. And little did I know that my high stress lifestyle, which didn't feel like a stress at that time was really contributing to all that weight gain. And um I spent most of my twenties, uh, having a family and having a baby and just dealing with this absolute chronic fatigue. And it wasn't until about 10 years later that I got, um, diagnosed by three different specialists, um, a, a hormone therapist, my naturopathic doctor, and my regular doctor to all tell me that I had adrenal fatigue. So my hormones were totally off. I, uh, was not making cortisol for most of the day, I should say I was making cortisol, but my cortisol within the first hour of waking up tanked to almost zero. And, um, and it was literally one of those events that brought tears to my eyes because I thought something had to have been wrong with me mentally. I didn't realize it was a physical issue. Um, so long story short, you know, I spent the next few years after that really leaning into understanding about lifestyle and health. I, um, went to a really, um, uh, highly recommended hormone therapist. And I said, I know you're a hormone therapist, but can I do this without any hormone therapy? Can I heal myself naturally? And I was fortunate enough that she took me on. And within a year, I was able to completely bring my hormones back to normal. Again, I started working out. I was able to go back to building business, you know, it was absolutely life-changing. And that's why I pivoted my own personal brand to helping people understand more of this information, because this is a prevalent issue that just persists and it's only growing uh, more and more. So that's, that's kind of my backstory and why we're here today. Yeah. So my, my first question for you is, you know, in working with that person, was it mostly, you know, nutrition focused, um, were there supplements involved? Like what would you say helped get your hormones back on track? Oh my goodness. It it was a process, right? I mean, like when you're doing it naturally, I think, um, nobody really prepared me for the process at that point. I had already undergone about three or four months of total lifestyle change. So I leaned into the dress lifestyle, which was, um, rechanging my diet instead of, uh, at that time I had been a, a vegan, uh, mostly raw vegan. And um, I went into more of an intuitive diet, just kind of listening to what my body felt like it needed. Um, I was still a vegan, um, but I was just eating more cooked foods and then, um, you know, resting a lot. Um, exercise was out of the question at that point, because at that point I was exercising so much that I was actually told that I needed to stop um, because the point that I was at, um, I was diagnosed as I should have been bedridden, quote unquote. <laughs> and the doctors were a little bit shocked that I was up and, you know, had this fitness um, brand and, you know, doing yoga and stuff. Um, so then it was um, sleep and I slept for probably 14 hours a day that first month. And then it kind of moved to 10 or 12. And, you know, every month it kind of, you know, got less and less. 
But, um, you know, 14 hours a day is easily done when you're, when you're sleeping 11 or 12 at night and taking a two or three hour, you know, nap in the afternoons, which was um, something that I did. So by the time I got to the hormone therapist, this is everything that had already been done. And she tweaked my diet. You know, we talked about, um, getting back onto meat meats, um, which I started with a lot of bone broths and fish. Uh, she talked to me about, about blood sugar balance, which was absolutely life-changing the blood sugar thing, which at that time it was like, you know, I'm not a soda person. I'm not a candy person, but I had a lot of fruit in my diet. So it's kind of a, a really huge turnaround to go from these smoothies that had like five or six banana, you know, these giant smoothies, um, to not touching a banana for like eight or nine months at that point. Yeah. Um, And, uh, and then with the exercise, it was just, you know, slowly get back into it. You show up, do a couple stretches on the mat. And then that turned into just getting outside and going for a short walk. And, um, eventually I was able to start playing pickleball, which (laughs) is often known as an old people sport. I I think it's changing nowadays, but, um, you know, back then it was very much, you know, an elder crowd. Um, and that was all I could keep up with. So, um, yeah, it was just a slow and steady, you know, gentle progress, not to say that there weren't times that I would do something unintentionally and crash and burn throughout, you know, the mm-hmm. process. Um, but it was just a, a consistent, steady, you know, yeah. keeping at it. Yeah. So interestingly enough, you know, we have very sister stories with this. Um, mm. I also, I also was diagnosed with adrenal fatigue in my twenties. And then again, in my early thirties, after owning a, a fitness studio where I was teaching boot camp classes and doing my own workouts and just burning myself into the ground, also having a young one year old at the time. So it wasn't sleeping sufficiently at night. And I thought I could, I thought I could handle it all. Like I felt good at the time. And I actually, I wanted to share this with the, with the audience. I had a, a compounding pharmacist friend of mine tell me that adrenal fatigue is something that catches up with you. So your adrenals they work in your favor in the moment, right? So Mm -hmm. you can, you can be that fitness brand, right? Just like I was, you can be that person who's, Hey, look at me arm balancing. Like I can do all these things. Right. And eventually (laughs) your body says, "Er," like it just sort of puts on the brakes. And all of a sudden, like, I know for me, I went from what I thought was this crazy level of fit and, um, you know, only sleeping five hours a night and just handling it and crushing life. That's what I thought. And then all of a sudden it was like, I couldn't hold a warrior pose in yoga. I yes. was just, my whole body was shaking. Um, I couldn't, I, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. Like I was so exhausted. I had to have caffeine after four o'clock in the afternoon or else I couldn't make it to bedtime. So we have very sister stories when it comes to the adrenal fatigue. And I, I do want to also say that not a lot of doctors even recognize adrenal fatigue as a real thing. Like this sort yeah. of an argument in, in the medicine world on whether it's a thing or not. But what can't be argued is your cortisol levels, right? And so I teach the four-legged hormone chair. So my listeners are used to hearing this, but you know, your, your cortisol is your survival and that's what your body's going to prioritize first. And so when that cortisol starts to suffer, it impacts, it it can impact your thyroid. It can impact your, your menstrual health. It can impact your blood sugar, which is what you just alluded to. So, you know, the stress in our lives, or even just you know, you're thinking, oh, I'm not emotionally stressed, but the physical stress of exercise, mm-hmm. right? Like I know a lot of my listeners are women who they work out five or six days a week and they're embracing fitness and they think they're, that they're doing the right things by exercising and moving and, um, you know, crushing it in the gym when in reality, that's, that's another physical stressor. And so if your body is suffering or it's having to pump out all this cortisol, eventually it's going to catch up with you. And for a lot of women, it catches up with weight gain. It catches up with exhaustion and fatigue, right? So I love that we've started here because I think this is the perfect point to say that, you know, burnout can be um, mental, emotional. It can also be physical. And it's something that I think most, if not every woman will deal with at some point in her life. I remember my, the same friend, this compounding pharmacist telling me, um, he's like, well, I'm not surprised that you are adrenally fatigued. He was like, you all, all young moms have adrenal fatigue. You know, like if you're, if you're dealing with a young one and then let Mm -hmm. alone the fact that you're exercising and you're putting these additional stressors on your body, it makes total sense. And so the same thing, you know, the same thing happened for me where my doctor was like, stop with the intensity. She was like, you know, sleep more, like schedule more sleep into your schedule. Um, 
in the afternoons, instead of lifting heavy weights or doing a hit workout, lie down, give your adrenals a rest. Right. And I kept thinking, what, like, how can I go from like balls to the wall to, you know, taking a nap? Like I don't take naps, you know, but I listened. And I, I, like you said, you, you used the phrase, you know, being more intuitive with the way you were eating and the way you were living. I did the same thing. And it was amazing because the weight started to fall off as I rested. It was like, my body was thanking me, right. And like my energy increased as I rested. So I want to also point out one thing that you mentioned too, and I don't want to take up the microphone, but, um, blood sugar regulation is huge. Right. And I think a lot of women are in this sort of cycle of everybody else oftentimes comes first, right? Our kids have to get off to school. Our, you know, dinner has to be on the table. We have to also maybe care for our parents or or other loved ones. And so a lot of times our own personal health goes to the back burner. So we still, maybe we still prioritize the exercise. We're still putting that physical stressor on our body, but when we aren't paying attention to our nutrition and what our body needs, like, I don't like to eat meat, but I've just learned over time that my body requires it. Like Mm -hmm. my ferritin levels, my iron levels, like everything else just indicates that my body needs it. So paying attention intuitively to what that is so that you're keeping your body stable from a blood sugar perspective, because any instability is going to cause that four-legged chair to be out of whack. It's going to cause the cortisol issues. It's going to cause the stress, right? It's just extra stress. So my question to you is, you know, I want to talk about this idea sort of between like, how do we, how do we balance between like the hustle of our day-to-day lives and this rest and relaxation? Like, how do you, you know, obviously it's not transitioning from one to the other, right. But it's finding a good balance between the two. So I'd love to talk about that. Yeah. I mean, that's the hardest thing, right. When you're going and then it's like, you need to stop. I think this is probably the most difficult part of the process of actually recovering is accepting the fact and it's a fact that can't be, uh, you know, negotiated with that we really need to have the the proper rest and restoration to continue to go the way that we want to go. And I think that we overlook that um, as a society, we don't we no longer have our tribe. As women, we're not only doing what we were intended to do with the support of a tribe; we're doing all that and more. We're raising children, raising a family, we're keeping a house. Lots of us have jobs. Lots of us have side hustles. We, you know, we do all the things. And in addition to that, we live um, much more overstimulating lives. So um, it really comes down to our brain waves and what state our brain waves are in. You can have um, two people doing the same activity, but it'd be in two totally different states. So for example, I love gardening. And when I get out and I move my body and I might be, you know, pulling a bunch of mulch up the hill, or I might be raking into the ground. It is absolutely relaxing. Um, there's a, there's kind of this physicality and this mindfulness that goes into it. But, you know, if you take that with somebody who just absolutely detests gardening and is sitting out there and thinking, this is awful, I hate this, like this is annoying or whatever kind of mental, um, you know, story they're telling themselves, that could create a lot more stress in their system. So the first thing is to be able to identify uh what things actually create true relaxation and restoration within yourself where you can actually get present. Um, A lot of people say meditate, but for some people, meditating is absolutely stressful. I have clients who try to meditate and they're building up all kinds of, um, you know, high, high driving um, brainwaves. Those, uh, is it the beta brainwaves that are, you know, keeping them in a non-restorative state. And, um, And when you can find those things that allow you to bring that wired mind down, because the brainwaves are directly um, related to your sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. So our nervous systems, either in fight or flight or rest and digest. Now, I mean, rest and digest is kind of always happening in the background, but we're only meant to be in these kind of high stress scenarios for about 15 to 30 minutes maximum and then have the restorative state come thereafter. You know, it's meant for us to run away from a bear or, you know, deal with a forest fire, but it's not meant for us to be at this moderate state of stress where we're sitting in traffic, um, you know, thinking about our day, thinking about our to-do list and dealing with all the people and not having that time to wind down. So this is super easy to just say, this is what it is, but when you find those activities that help you restore, Um, When I was restoring, 
I used to take Pomodoro breaks. So every 25 minutes, I would take five minutes off and tap back into a more restorative state. I kind of think of it like you're winding a yo-yo up. If you're winding, 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 winding the whole day, the last thing you can expect is for yourself to go to sleep at night and just completely unwind. So many people actually go to sleep, they get the right amount of sleep, but they're not getting any restorative sleep because their brain waves are so wired from being overstimulated throughout the day. So if you can take five minute breaks every 30 to 60 minutes, where you're actually tapping back into a state of mindfulness, where you're actually slowing those brain waves down, slowing the heart rate down, getting back into your breath authentically, like you can't fake this, right? Like you have to really feel that internal sensation where your body um, switches off that sympathetic response. Then you're not like so wound up. And so then the next key I would say is how you begin and end your day, how you end your day is a prelude to how you, how well you sleep and how well you sleep is a prelude to how you start your day and how you start your day, you know, so on and so forth is going to put you in the state of mind or in the state of being, so to speak of whether, of how stressed you are versus how not stressed you are. So, you know, I don't, I'm not a fan of telling people, you know, sit down and relax because a lot of times people sit there and they get antsy, you know, but find something that relaxes you and find a way that to tap back into that for short periods regularly throughout the day so that you can create space um, and dependent on, you know, how stressed you are. Some, sometimes an hour is not enough space at night, but my wind down routine begins at the end of dinner or actually at the start of dinner. We have this time to connect with the family. We often play family games. That's really enjoyable. And while it might not be restorative or relaxing, it's enjoyable. It's fun. And I think a lot of us don't take time to have fun, but it's really important to have that. And then as we come down, you know, to cleaning the kitchen, then that mindfulness state comes back for me because I, and sometimes there's a mindset shift. Sometimes you can say, Hey, I can get this done. If I just chill out about it and just like set a timer so I can get lost in time, sweeping the floor or whatever. For some people that works, that works for me. Um, but then, you know, I have this whole process of getting uh, my teeth brushed, you know, washing my face, doing my hair, et cetera. And then me and my husband, we have this quiet time where we do some stretching. Um, and sometimes we'll play like a TED talk or a documentary, something just really relaxed before getting into bed. And then I, I take out my book and read. And lots of times when I'm in this amazing state, like it takes me no time to fall asleep. Like I can't even remember falling asleep because it's just so automatic. And, you know, and you, and you wake up feeling a lot better that way. Now I, I do want to caveat that if you are chronically fatigued, um, that feeling of feeling great when you wake up might not happen right away. Oftentimes what actually happens is when you start getting an implement, a, a, a good amount of rest, your body feels even more tired. It's almost like it wakes up and it's like, oh my gosh, I need that. And so, I mean, you could probably speak a little more to what happens hormonally in this instance, you know, it's like, it stops pumping out as much cortisol. And so, you know, oftentimes my clients tell me, um, it, you know, I, I feel exhausted. I'm sleeping more. I feel exhausted. I can't sleep that much. And it's like, actually your body is communicating to you that it needs more sleep. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, yeah. And that's a great point because I think, you know, I've said this before, but it's, it's worth sharing that a lot of people don't understand that really there's two different things that can happen with your cortisol. A lot of people. And I think just society has taught us that if you're in a high stress environment, your cortisol is high. That's not always the case, especially for women. I actually see with my clients more of the opposite, which is their cortisol is completely depleted, which is like you and like me, right? When I had mine tested during my adrenal fatigue, it was basically starting out at the bottom of the chart and staying at the bottom of the chart. Whereas mm -hmm. your natural cortisol rise should be highest in the morning and it should actually fall throughout the day so that your melatonin can take over for sleep production at night. Some women that's backwards. Some women, it's the opposite, right? Where they actually can't wake up in the morning. Their cortisol is very, very depleted in the morning. And some of them have this surge of cortisol at night, which prevents them from going to sleep at night. Others like you and I have this sort of almost flat line, right? Where it's just like, we have over time churned and burned, whether that's through physical or emotional stress to the point where our body's just like, I can't do it anymore. White flag, right? Here's the white flag. Mm -hmm. So I love that you shared sort of your, your evening routine and everything else. And it made me think of this idea that I think a lot of people, I listen to Brenda Burchard. Um, I listen to him every single day on his growth day app. And 
one of the things that he talks about is this idea that too many people are out there letting life lead them as opposed to really intentionally leading their lives. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, what is your intention? What are your intentions throughout the day? You know, and having that conversation with yourself, having that, um, visioning, right? Like I know for me, like I've always been like this. I don't know why I was wired like this, but even in high school, I can remember thinking what's tomorrow, you know, like, okay, I have this test tomorrow, or I have, I'm meeting this person tomorrow. Like, what do I have coming up? And what am I going to envision for that? Like, how do I want to show up right for those different experiences? And listening to him is, is, is a great recommendation. If you don't know where to start with living a more intentional life, listen to somebody like a John Maxwell or Brennan Burchard. Um, because you'll, you'll start to gain this amazing perspective and, and personal development is so key. But for me, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, the morning, you know, I am not a morning person. I never have been. Um, but even this year, since January, this has been 11 months in the making. I have every day I made the commitment that I would wake up and I would do my devotional first thing in the morning. My devotional is one page. Okay. So it literally is like less than two minutes, but I, I sit up in the bed, I put my feet on the floor, I open it up, I read, and then I sort of close my eyes and have like a moment of like prayer and meditation. It literally takes me two minutes, but it sets me up for the right mm-hmm. mindset. Right. And then another thing that Brendan talks about is he talks about transitions throughout your day. And I know he's, he's shared before that one of his transitions, which works for me is doorways. So when he enters a new doorway, he reevaluates like who in this room needs me on my A game today, right? That's his question. And so for me, it's been life-changing because if I'm out and about and then I come home to my family, I enter the doorway and I have a moment where I just, just literally 10 seconds where I'm like, I take a big breath and I'm like, okay, now I'm mom, right? Now Mm -hmm. I'm mom. This is who needs me, right? I'm resetting myself physiologically with this. You got, you might've heard of these like physiological sighs um, where you literally just, big breath in two times in a row and your body just relaxes, right? And you get yourself into the right mindset for the right relationships at that any given time. So I think those are some great, um, some great things as well. But I I like this idea of creating restoration breaks. And I love what you were saying about the brain waves and how everybody's different, right? Like gardening for you might be peaceful, whereas it might be more stressful for me, um, (laughs) you know, or something that people enjoy or don't enjoy. But I think it's, it's interesting. Like, how should people go about? Cause I think sometimes we can get so far away from like who we are, if that makes sense, especially kind of coming back to that idea of women, putting a lot of other people first, putting a lot mm-hmm. of other things first. Uh, I know I have this conversation with women uh, as a health coach who leads health coaches. I have this conversation a lot with women who are like, well, I don't know what my hobbies are, or I don't know what you know, I don't really, I didn't have friends before I joined this community or whatever. Like, I think a lot of women are a little lost with kind of tapping into what restores them and it's different for everyone. So do you have any tips on like, how can someone go about figuring that out again? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, when we, one of the main problems that I see that happens to us as people in general is that there is so much going on all the time. And so we, there, there's almost this lack of space. And it's interesting because, you know, science tells us that being bored is actually good for you. You know, it's this time where if you spend time alone, we actually have a practice in our house where for 15 minutes a day, every day, the kids, parents, everybody needs to just go be bored for 15 minutes. And it just means take this time. Um, do not have a book. Do not have your phone. Do not have an agenda. Just like go sit, be alone. And allow your thoughts, allow yourself to be. I mean, sometimes I I won't even think during this time I enter this just extremely meditative state because I'm just laying there and staring at the ceiling. But other times there's a lot of thoughts going on. And it's important to have this type of space in your life because this is a time that you process things, not just mentally, but physically and emotionally as well. And most of us don't get this space ever, like ever. We're just going from one thing to the next. We're waking up you know, getting the breakfast, taking the kids, going to work, doing the thing and just schedule, schedule, schedule. And when we're not, we're on our phones, right? So we're like looking up something or we're shopping online or, you know, fill in the blank, even if it's good things like listening to podcasts or reading our books, I have that propensity to want to fill every ounce of my time with quote unquote value. But um, at the end of the day, to really think about what adds value to you, you have to remove a lot of the things that don't. You have to make space for it. 
And this is one of the most powerful practices you can do, um, you, you know, and it's a movement now that people call minimalism, but, you know, I, I like to uh, move away from that word because a lot of people think minimalism and they think, you know, white houses and clear spaces and decluttering and, you know, Marie Kondo or whatnot. And, um, but the truth is, it's just this philosophy of asking, does this add value to my life? You have such limited time and energy, but moreover limited attention, right? Like anybody can sit and give zero attention to something and just waste their time and energy. But when you have a limited amount of life and everything is just shouting at you from social media to phone notifications, to your children, to, you know, all the events, I mean, you just, you go on Groupon or like Facebook events or whatever, and you can fill your calendar so easily. It's, it's really important now that we're diligent at saying no and saying no a lot so that you can make space for things in your life. And you start with the obvious, right? So the obvious things for, I'll share what is important to me. And it was insane because I told my husband the other day, I was like, I used to live a life of so much desire, so much want. Like I wanted to be good at the ukulele. I wanted to play the sports and I wanted to, you know, be this type of friend and host these types of meetings every week and be part of the community and all this stuff. And now there's literally three things that are important to me. And if it doesn't incorporate those three things, it's an absolute no. And that first thing is my own mental and physical health and wellness. So that's number one, which is kind of a given. I think if you don't have your mental and physical health, it's really hard to enjoy or do anything in life. Number two is my family and the people in my life. And number three is my business and my business has become my hobby. So if it, if it doesn't fit into those three things. And so now what happens is I move into, so this is like kind of taking inventory and we move into okay, what fits outside of those three things? What does it? Some people, you know, I think you really need something for yourself, right? So for me, it's my business. For some people, um, like my mom, it's, it's playing music or traveling, right? Or painting. If you have one of those things where you're like, I really enjoy it. I know I just get lost in this space and it feels so good. And you can take that and incorporate it with the key areas of your life, which is incorporate it with your health, with your community or connecting with people. Um, and as well as getting space for yourself, then that's a really great place to start. But I mean, you chart it out, right? Like it's, it's one thing to conceptualize, but you take the time to chart out your entire week and see where all that time is spent. Um, what are the things you did? What were the things you paid attention to? Who were the people you saw? And, and then ask, you know, why am I doing this? What kind of value is this adding to me? And can I eliminate it? And if you can reduce everything by so much, I mean, I guess it depends on the person, but what I really see happening in our lives, my life included is when there becomes too much and too much is like anything more than five kind of key items, really. Like most people have two to five, I find, but anything more than five outside of this list, it's almost like everything's kind of only half done. Right. I don't, you know, I don't know if you can say that, you know, the word, but it's kind of half, half, but done, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and things get left with loose ends. And that doesn't feel good to your soul. Like there's what happens as actually creates a subconscious stress because all the time in the back of your mind, there's always something to do. Like eventually I got to do that. I got to do that. And so if you can reduce that and you finally get yourself to the space where in a day or in a week, you're like, man, I don't know what to do with my time. Like I'm kind of like, I'm kind of free. Like I'm really free. Like there's really, you know, everything's been good and taken care of and I get to do what I want. I get to flow. And then we reach that flow state. Now you really have this time to be inspired, to take action, to contribute. And you're doing it a hundred percent because a part of you is not over here, over there, thinking about this, thinking about that, or feeling rushed or whatever. It is a different way of living life. I mean, it is completely empowering and it's absolutely life-changing. And it just starts by getting to know yourself. You can't get to know yourself if, if everything's too stuffed up. Yeah, that's so good. So good. My life coach that I've been working with for a dozen years or so is a good friend of mine. And, and she always talks about like creating margin, right? Like mm. sometimes, when, sometimes when I'll complain to her about, I'm just feeling a lack of clarity and, or I'm feeling really high strung. Her response to me is then where are you not creating margin in your life? She, mm -hmm. and, you know, and sometimes it is like being bored, like, you know, making no plan. Um, I always like to tell my, my friends, like my health coaches that I lead, 
I always ask them the question of like, when was the last time that you really felt like you were in your joy zone, like that you really felt full of energy, like, and also in what place? Cause I think I find that sometimes like actual environments matter so much. Like for me, yeah. being, being outdoors in nature is just sort of recentering, right? It's like regrounding. It's, it's just the sense of fresh air and, and, um, creativity, right? Like my creativity flows more, more freely when I'm outside. So asking that question too, of like, where can I make margin in my life and, and in what places and what circumstances do I feel the most energy and then just mm-hmm. create more of that, right? Like sometimes I think we, we can so like, so overcomplicate, you know, I mean, I, I love that, that people nowadays are getting more and more into like meditation and there's all these meditation apps and wearable devices and all these different things that we can do. And it's like, but sometimes it, it's like, what if we scaled it back? Like, what if it really was simple enough to just say, Hey, like, I'm going to have some quiet time, some alone time. I'm going to have, I'm just going to go to this place that I love with no agenda and see what happens. And I think it's, it is so powerful in those moments in my life where my life coach has had to encourage me to schedule margin. Like literally, I mean, I think, I think we're very similar. Like I'm very type a, so she's like, okay, Jenny, like when you're, when you're planning out your planner this week, where are you going to create margin (laughs) margin for yourself? You know? And so it sounds crazy to say, but for some of us, it has to happen that way. Like you have to schedule it into your life to say, this is my open space time. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's there for me. So I love that. Um, let's see, I wanted to talk a little bit more about just this idea of you know, routine, you talked about sort of your end of day routine. I'd love to hear maybe how you start your day, um, different things that you can do to sort of be in the driver's seat of of your life. Like we talked about before, like what are some ways that you can really control what, not what happens to you, but how you react to what happens to you, as opposed to sort of just letting life lead you throughout the day. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of, um, understanding your system so that you can use that, you can kind of exploit it to your advantage. Um, And what I mean by this is, I mean, you kind of do um, this on a physiological level by teaching people about hormones, right? When you learn about like your psychology. So one of the things that was kind of um, changing for me was understanding that I have kind of a severe uh, bout of ADHD. And so the way that my brain operates is a little bit different. And exploring that space is important, but, um, when you know that, uh, certain things feel good, or like you say, exploring what, um, what creates kind of that fun or that joy for yourself, uh, those, those times when you schedule them into your day, it's going to help move you into a place where you know yourself better so that you can continue to build upon that strategy. Right. So for me, waking up, I feel like there are two questions and I'm going to say uh, waking up first. I, I think it's important to not just jump out of bed. Now it's, this is crazy because, you know, you hear all these life, like these business coaches or these motivational talks that tell you, you need to get out of bed, get the cold water, like do the exercise. Like don't, you know what I mean? Five, four, three, two, one, all the things. And they're really good if you have a problem with motivating yourself. But I find that a lot of people who are burnt out don't have a problem with motivating themselves. The the fact that they're burnt out is the fact that they're actually doing too much. They're carrying too much. And so what needs to happen at the top of my day is to create that space where I, like you do your devotional, I wake up and I do my gratitude. So I wake up and it is, it is my own prayer. It is my way of reflecting on what my intention is for the day. Like I might have a busy day ahead. I might have a big Halloween party going on, a ton of people coming to the house and I got to do X, Y, and Z. But then I like to think not only what am I grateful for, but moving into my day, I'm about to accomplish all these action items. And for what, what's my purpose. And so it goes back to the central point. My purpose might be, I want everybody to have fun today. And then, so when I take action and I'm like, well, I have to dust the whole house. And my husband's like, no, you don't have to dust the whole house. And I, I, then I ask myself, is this going to contribute to people having more fun? And if the answer is yes or no, so it's no, then we eliminate it. Right. So we go back to this process of identifying what is going to actually add value to 
and that's subjective, right? Because va value can be found in anything. So I'm always talking about you need to identify specifically what adds value to you and your own, you know, how your brain works, how your body works, as well as your own goals. Um, so that's number one. Number two, you just got to, you got to understand that you got to do what's practical. Um, and I think this speaks a lot to, I get, I get caught up in emotions. So I'm going to share a uh, intimate story that's been happening lately because this is kind of how the process occurs. So we have two dogs and we have, one of them is a Doberman and the Doberman snapped at my baby's face the other day. So, I, you know, I'm not going to go into like all the details, but we're, you know, we're the, again, a type personality. So we take our training very seriously and all the above. And um, what I know is looking back, this was a hundred percent our fault because we have been slacking on the dog's training and we allowed the baby in a space where the dog was close and it was, it was a short scare and, you know, nothing happened, but we don't take that lightly. You know, if there's, if, if we're in the space, the whole idea is what is going on. And we had a whole day, you know, process where we talked about it and then we processed it for a whole day, day and a half about all the options. And one of the options in the table is rehoming the dog, not because it's a dog's fault, but because practically speaking, do we have the space, time, and energy to send the dog to the training school, which those are not, you know, that's not an, an easy thing. You don't just send them. And then, and then, you know, we talked, we talked to the trainer and the trainer said you had to have this time commitment, et cetera. And so all these logistics start showing up. And from an emotional standpoint, the, you know, there are two ways of going. It's like, I'm absolutely fearful for my child. Get rid of the dog. That's not where we were at. We were like, this is hundred percent our responsibility. We love this dog. There was no reason for him to snap. Had we not put him in the situation? It was, it was like a situation. It was hundred percent our fault. So do we step up to the plate and do it all? And an emotional level, all of us were absolutely, yes, we would do this all. But the idea of like giving up my dog had to be processed, even though in my mind, it's like, there's no way it had to be processed. Like if we could find him a good home that had all the things, you know, what kind of value would that add to him? What kind of value would that add to us? You know, so I'm putting this out there because I know a lot of judgment and there's a lot of different, you know, uh, perspectives that can come here. But the idea is like to step back and just process all the things minus your own emotions, minus people's judgment. What is the most practical thing, not just for you, but for everyone, for the dog, right? Is it practical for the baby? Is it practical for our children who are attached to the dog? Is it practical for us, our time, money, and energy? And I mean, at the moment, you know, he's still here. So um, we've been able to process through it, but it wasn't an easy process. And the whole point of this story is sometimes in your life, you're faced with something that feels like a very difficult thought. Like I, I didn't even want to give it a thought. It was like, it's not a question, you know, he's going to stay here and we just need to figure it out and, you know, step up to the plate. But we had to consider, is it worth a risk? you know, uh, you know, is it manageable? How manageable does it have to be when you have a big dog like that? That's, it's a lot of time and attention and prevention that you have to do because, um, while a lot of people think that, you know, dogs can be docile there, it's, there's always a possibility for, you know, their instincts to come through. So, um, it, the decision isn't always easy. The, the point is that it's, um, sometimes you really have to sit and process and make the most practical decision. Um, at the time that I was going through my recovery, my husband was also saying, you know, maybe we should divorce because you're focused so much on your business. Um, I had fallen into a bit of debt trying to scale my business. And then on top of it, I have this medical condition and then my husband wants to divorce. And so emotionally it was like, it's not practical to, just not work because we owe money, but it's also not what I want to just separate, you know? Um, so, you, so it's when you navigate from the point of what is my goal and is this going to add value to my goal? And is this the most practical decision? All that conflict and confusion goes away. And when you can take the conflict and confusion away, it doesn't mean there isn't emotions with it, but it, 
it creates that resilience, you know, and I'm sorry, this is kind of a roundabout way, but it's, you know, it is sometimes difficult to articulate the, the type of resilience that you're after doesn't necessarily mean you aren't facing hardship or emotional difficulty. It's about being able to move through with that decision with confidence instead of kind of sitting, you know, in limbo and, and letting it all beat you down and, and just kind of trying to keep your head about above, above water. Yeah. I love yeah. that. I mean, I, I think that makes such sense because I just think as, as human beings, we're so inclined to make emotional decisions, like emotional in the moment decisions that may or may not be the best decisions in that moment. And so bringing in the pa- the practicality piece is so common sense, but yet so overlooked, you know what I mean? Like, I just yeah. think so many people are just like kind of coming back to that same idea of, you know, in this moment, what do I want as opposed to what do I need for the next moment? Exactly. Right. Like what do I, what do I need to be progressing me forward? You mentioned earlier that you, you know, you're a person who loves personal development, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, not just, I mean, you're, you're very similar to me and that I not only want to learn more about myself and how I interact in the world and with other people, but I also want, I also want to know like, what are the f- like physiological things that I can do to make sure that my mind and my body align, right. That I'm, I'm showing up with, as someone with energy for my relationships, but also for myself and my physical body. Um, we talked a lot about like down-regulating the nervous system and, and we've kind of touched on that stuff already, but I'd love to know, you know, what are some, whether it's people that you listen to or, or, um, what, what has been the most impactful personal development for you personally? Because I think that as you're talking and you're sharing more of your story and, these more intimate stories, I'm realizing like how similar you and I really are. Right. And so Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that if people are listening to my podcast, they're probably very similar to me. And so I'd love to just hear like, what are some of the most impactful things that either you do on a regular basis or you listen to or read or, or study on a regular basis, or what are some things that have made the biggest impact for you in sort of this journey of self-discovery? Yeah. Um, the first thing is to get tested. I know that's, it's, it's, it is a resource, but, um, I think a lot of people just go to their GP and, you know, get the general test and it's fine. Um, and I get that it's in, in a respect, it's a luxury, you know, to be able to say, Hey, where are my hormones at? Like on an annual or biannual basis, at the very least, I always say, figure out where your hormones are at, figure out what, um, the full allergy panel, not just the thing that has like two dozen items, but the thing that has over a hundred items, both environmentally and food wise has made a huge difference in myself and all my clients, because, you know, when you are sensitive to foods and environment, you have like a histamine, like, a you know, immune response in your body that creates inflammation, creates more stress, et cetera. Um, understanding where your gut health is your microbiome, Um, understand your psychology, you know, it seems like a lot, but we have these five tests that we say start off with, which is a hormone panel, the allergy panel, gut mapping, um, get a psychological analysis, make sure you're not neurodivergent in any sort of way. And then we've added on like a heavy metals, because apparently that's not a common thing that people test or cleanse for Um, all of these things. Very, once you understand this is becomes very easy to understand um, step-by-step how you tick and what's best for you. Because I mean, it's not just one thing, right? It it would be easy if it's just like one thing is like change your diet and boom, like you're done. But we're all so different and we respond so differently that it is all the things cumulatively that create our stress response in our system or that create a relaxing system. So that's number one. But number two, um, I really love stoicism, the philosophy And, um, you know, we started off as minimalism, but I, it's a tough thing because, you know, we're emotional beings and I absolutely love emotion. Stoicism is not about non-emotion, but it's about understanding the practicality of that emotion and being able to step outside of it. And so when you get into a situation where it's like, you just got to do what makes sense. Like if you're hormonally fatigued or hormonally imbalanced, like what makes sense right now is not to go lift weights, build, you know, build your physique or lose weight. Like you need to get healthy first. You know, um, if your schedule is completely burning you out, it makes sense to remove some of it. And you might not want to, 
You know, you, you might want to be able to do all the things, but the truth is you're not able to do all the things. So how practical is it to fight against that notion? Um, so that's number one. Uh, in terms of like people I listen to and stuff, I love Brandon Bruchard. I feel like he's right in line with how, you know, um, just the mindset, you know, peace and good productive strategies for being high performance. And a lot of it does involve taking care of yourself and, um, and mind, you know, and, and your perspective on life. But I actually really relate to Tom Bilyeu, impact theory. Um, it, you know, he's grown on me because of some of the things that he says and how his mind works and kind of his notions. Uh, I really relate to a lot compared to most other people, but um, I love him. And then I love uh, Hub Labs, Andrew Huberman. Are you familiar with him as well? Yeah. So he's more about like neuroscience, but, um, you know, just talking about like mind and body and how that works from a science level. Um, I find, you know, myself researching or diving a little deeper or, you know, trying new techniques and things. But I, th I really think at the end of the day, uh, you know, resources are awesome. It can feel really confusing and overwhelming going through all of them. Just taking the time to have space to uh, grow your knowledge. And, and I really think that when it comes to this stuff, it is, a, it is a lifelong journey of learning and growing, um, in yourself and in, in all the areas. It's, just, I just find that it's so interesting that a lot of us are interested in business or making money or, you know, learning about the latest fashion trends or like what's going on in the news politically or whatever, but, um, we take less interest in, getting on the same page with our own health, mm -hmm. you know? So that's a huge piece um, for me is just making sure if I'm spending too much time following politics or what the stock market's doing, like, am I taking that time to follow like what's, what's new and innovative in health and, you know, keeping up with my own reg regime yeah. regime and, um, and understanding where I'm at. So, yeah. 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 I love those, those people that you mentioned. They're all people that I subscribe to as well. I'll make sure to link them up in the show notes so you guys can have easy access of finding their stuff. Tom Bill, you kind of cracks me up because he can, he's very straightforward. So he, he may be your taste or he may not be, you know, like he's very to the point. Um, but I, yeah, <laughs> Huberman, Huberman lab is another favorite of mine, learning more about the body and, and things like that as well. But yeah. I mean, coming back to just making sure that each person listening to this understands that their body is unique. And I think as women, we have this almost disease that's out there where women want to compare, compare themselves to other women and, yeah. you know, oh, well this diet worked for my friend Betsy. So I'm going to, I need to do this diet. Right. Or, um, my friend so-and-so has this happening and, or whatever it's like, it, or you see what you see on Instagram, right? Like the highlight reels of everybody else's life. You're like, oh, you know, so many people are meditating. I'll try meditating. Maybe meditating doesn't work for you, right? Like maybe something else needs to happen. I know for me, I felt that pressure in my twenties, yeah. just as sort of an aside note. Um, I remember seeing like meditation sort of on the rise and thinking like, oh yeah, you know, and people are doing this, like I need to do this. I tried so hard to do it. And it just, it, the, the type that I was trying that everybody else was doing wasn't working for me until I finally realized in another life moment, like totally separated that for me, moving meditation is better. So going for a walk or mm -hmm. like I said before, getting out in nature, like that works for me. And so I would encourage, you know, just to sort of second what you were saying, I would encourage the listener to really think like, listen, what works for someone else is might not, and put, most likely won't work for you. And so getting the right testing for yourself, looking at those cortisol numbers, looking at your hormones, looking to see if there is an actual chemical reason why your energy is off is a great first step. But also making sure that when you do sort of have the epiphany of, right, like I need to make some changes, right? You and I both have that as part of our story. I need to scale back the workouts. I need to rest more. I need to change my nutrition, right? Like I need to eat more meat, whatever it is, like it's different for everyone. When you start to have those epiphanies, the commitment fault, like it, the commitment part is easy because then you're like, well, now I realize why I need to do this. And so now I can follow through on this, Right. But sort of to wrap it all up in a nice, pretty package, to do all of that work, to do the testing, to uncover your unique deficiencies, to do the work on yourself physically with your nutrition and your exercise, but to not address your mindset and mm -hmm. to not address like ultimately the stress or what's, you know, what's causing the stress. Those other things don't matter. 
those other yeah. things won't matter as much, right? Because you've got to address, like, I, I, I'm telling you that my biggest epiphany for this year for myself that I never would have imagined, right? Like every year I try to level myself up in my health. And this year I, I've been thinking to myself, like, I don't know how much higher I can go, right? Like I feel physically fit. I feel strong. My blood work is fantastic. My hormones are in balance. Like there's not much further I can go, right? Until I started this podcast. And I just so happened to be connected to um, multiple trauma-informed therapists. And the topics that we would cover on trauma started to really, it really started to seep into my mind. Like, oh gosh, like this is something that's holding me back. Like this plays a huge role into why I can't let go. This plays a huge role into why stillness is the death of me, right? Like, and so now I'm learning, like, this is my next area to step into. This is that next level of comfort zone that I have to just say, okay, like if I want to get better and level up again, this is the space I have to enter, right? Those things happen for everyone. So most likely everyone listening to this, you know, your energy is off perhaps, or you feel fatigued, you feel burnout, you feel stuck, right? Like those plateaus that you're feeling are real, but weighing the odds of like, what makes me uncomfortable, right? We talked earlier about like finding the place that you feel more joy and more energy and going to that place more often. But also what's the place that causes me to feel uncomfortable and how can I just take one step into that to become mm. better? So I think you just wrapped it up perfectly by talking about getting to the root cause of your deficiencies, right? Like making that the first step, embracing your health and wellness journey, but also doing that without addressing mindset. It's yeah. like, you know, you don't have all wheels on the car to move forward. So it makes yeah. total sense that, that we need all three. So I, it's been a pleasure talking to you as always. I I feel like yeah. we're like lost sisters that have sort of similar stories and similar messaging. And I hope that there are listeners. I know there are listeners out there who are taking great things from this, from this conversation today. So I want to thank you for being here. I would love for you to point people in your direction. Where can people find you, whether it's social media or whatnot, I'll let you handle, handle that piece. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a website, mj-gordon.com. Um, if listeners get signed up to my newsletter. We do a whole week of, um, just launching, kickstarting off the energy. Um, you talk about four pillars and hormones. We, and, and I wanted to just kind of cover on, you were talking about without the mindset, but we do kind of the four, uh, pillars on life. Like you, your spaces are important. Your money is important, but your health and mindset are important. And if any one of those four are off, it's really difficult to, have, you know, balance of energies and to move forward to build off that platform. So, um, you know, we kind of kick off a whole week of that. And then I have a free training that will be in the newsletter as well. Um, for, uh, it's level up your energy, level up your life, um, or better energy for a better life. The, <laughs> I like the, the audience to vote on what the title is, but you know, it's an awesome training that help them, um, take the first step to get better energy and they could start today and make a difference. So I appreciate Excellent. you having me here, Jenny. It's been, I just feel like we can talk forever. We, you know, can yeah. have like 10 episodes and yeah, for <laughs> so. sure. I know when we were first meeting, we're like, okay, let's pick one topic to talk about today, yeah. which is, you know, burnout and fatigue. And, but we could, we could definitely have you back on the show in the future to, to discuss other things. Um, clearly our stars align quite a bit. So yeah. friends, I'll make sure to let, to link up in the show notes, the website, everything about MJ so that you guys can get in contact with her. But Again, thank you, my friend, for being here. I'm sure this won't be the last time we chat. Thank you all for listening.